I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about my background in these issues. I've been thinking quite a bit lately about uh, what might be called the Al Gore formula. That formula, uh, by that formula, there are about eight years now left to run uh, in my marriage. Uh, like Al Gore, I married my college sweetheart, and this was a long time ago, 32 years ago. And when we got married, we were young and idealistic, and we spent the first seven years of our life together living in a utopian environmentalist community in New York, in, uh, New York State, in the eastern United States. We lived in a very small living space. It was just about 65 square meters. We didn't have an automobile. Uh, we didn't have a lawn. We didn't have a clothes dryer. We did our grocery shopping on foot and most of our other errand shopping. And when we needed to travel longer distances, we uh, went by public transportation. This utopian community was New York City. Uh, in fact, Manhattan. Our, we lived in a very nice apartment building on the 14th floor on the Upper East Side at, uh, uh, on East 69th Street. When I say this to people and uh, present uh, New York City as a, a, a role model of environmental responsibility, they're often uh, incredulous, even if they happen to be New Yorkers themselves. The, to most people, including most New Yorkers, New York City looks like a uh, nightmare landscape of diesel fumes and uh, concrete and garbage piled up on the streets and uh, traffic congestion. But in fact, by most of the most significant measures, uh, New York City really is uh, an environmental role model. The average Manhattanite uh, consumes just 340 liters of gasoline every year. That's a fraction of the US average. It's a number, in fact, that the United States as a whole hasn't matched since the mid-1920s when the uh, most widely owned automobile in the United States was the Model T Ford. The national average in uh, the US is uh, 1,720 liters right now. Uh, Australia's is, I, I believe, a bit lower, but it's right up there with the United States. The United States, Canada, and Australia are the big three in terms of uh, fossil fuel use in the world. Uh, the US average is five times Manhattan's and three times uh, New York City's. 82 percent of employed Manhattan residents get to work either uh, on foot, by public transit, or by bicycle. That's 10 times the US average. Uh, it's eight times the average for uh, workers in Los Angeles County. New York City residents uh, individually use less energy in all categories than any other Americans. Uh, the if uh, New York City by population is larger than all but 11 American states, 11 of the 50 American states, if it were granted statehood, it would rank 51st, last, in per capita energy use. The average uh, New York City resident uses just about 4,700 kilowatt hours of electricity each year. The average resident of Dallas, Texas uses 16,000. And as a consequence of uh, all these things, uh, the average New York City resident has the smallest carbon footprint of any American, uh, just uh, 7.1 metric tons of uh, carbon per year in comparison with 24 and a half for the average US resident. And the average for Manhattan residents uh, is even lower than the New York City uh, uh, average. In fact, it's about the same as that for the average Swede. Well, after seven years in New York City, uh, my wife and I and our one-year-old daughter decided to move to the country. And in 1985, we left the city for a little tiny town of about 4,000 people 100 miles north of New York City. Our house was built in uh, 1790, just about exactly the time that the uh, convict transportation to Australia began from England. It's, our house is situated across a dirt road from a 4,000 acre nature preserve. We have uh, the uh, bears and 
deer and wild turkeys in our yard to the extent that they've begun to seem like pests. We felt when we moved that we had uh, stepped into Arcadia. But in fact, our new life was an ecological disaster. Our electricity consumption went from 4,000 kilowatt hours in our final year in New York City in 1984 uh, to about 30,000 kilowatt hours. Uh, and our house doesn't even have central air conditioning. When we lived in New York City, we didn't have a car. We got around on foot. Uh, when we knew we were going to move, we bought our first car, a very big move. But as soon as we arrived in the country, we realized that one car wasn't enough because when your car is at the mechanic being repaired, you can't go and pick it up unless you have another car. And so we uh, quickly ended up with two. And then uh, as a consequence of a mild midlife crisis on my part, we ended up with a third. And uh, then when our children got to be driving age, the, that uh, luxury became a necessity. Uh, my wife and I both work at home and therefore commute to our offices by climbing a flight of stairs, and yet between us we manage to drive about 48,000 kilometers a year. When people who live in the city imagine life in the country, they picture going for walks in the woods and kayaking on streams and gathering eggs for their own chickens. Uh, but what you actually do when you move to the country is move into a car, uh, and you move your children into car seats because there is essentially no place that is accessible on foot, and every place is too far away to be served by any rational uh, public transit system. I was recently uh, driving on a uh, highway behind a, a, a minivan, and I could see through the rear window that the children in the back seat were watching two different movies on, uh, on uh, screens that were mounted on the ceiling. When we lived in uh, New York City, our pediatrician was in the lobby of our building, just an elevator a ride away. My dentist now, where we live in Connecticut, is two towns away. It's a round uh, trip, automobile trip of 50 kilometers. When we lived in New York City, heat escaping from our apartment during the winter helped to heat the apartment above ours. And now, uh, in our 200 plus year old house, we could virtually place the furnace in the yard because the heat simply rises through uh, the two stories and through the roof. When I, I had an, es uh, an editor at a magazine called Esquire in the United States who grew up in Baltimore, in a row house in Baltimore, uh, houses closely uh, placed next to each other down in the, in, in the central city, he said his parents always knew when one of their neighbors had been evicted or had moved out because their heating bill would spike. The explanation for all of this, for the efficiencies of uh, New York City and for the inefficiencies of the place where I live now, is uh, the very thing that to most people, to most Americans anyway, makes New York City look like a, an ecological nightmare. It's population density. Manhattan is extraordinarily dense. There are uh, 67,000 people per square mile, which is, uh, you'll notice that I've done some metric uh, conversions. That's about 26,000 per square kilometer. Uh, that uh, level of density is 800 times the US average. It's about 30 times uh, Los Angeles, 30 times Brisbane's, uh, 16 times Melbourne's, uh, about five times Chicago's. In uh, a couple of years ago, the magazine Forbes, the business magazine Forbes, rated the 50 American states on their greenness, on their eco-friendliness and shows Vermont as the greenest of the 50 American states. Uh, Vermont uh, is actually a th uh, only one thousandth as dense as New York City. In fact, if you spread all 8.2 million New Yorkers out across the countryside at the density of Vermont, uh, you would require the equivalent of the land area of, uh, of, of 10 American states, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Delaware, New Jersey, Virginia, Maryland, and Rhode Island. And then, of course, you'd have to find places to put all the people you were displacing in order to park all those New Yorkers. And in addition, and this is the environmental key, you'd have to create the extraordinary infrastructure that we require to support the way we live, the roads, 
the power uh, generation facilities, the power transportation facilities, the water uh, resources, the water processing, the sewage treatment, uh, the schools, the shopping malls, the, uh, all this tremendous uh, fuel consuming, emission spewing infrastructure that we drag along behind us wherever we go. The key fact about density, about density of people and of destinations, is that by moving people closer together, by moving people and their daily destinations, we limit their opportunities for reckless consumption, uh, as well as forcing most of them to live in some of the most energy, inherently energy efficient uh, residential housing there is, apartment buildings. In Australia, as in the United States, uh, the trend in residential structures has been exactly the opposite. Uh, the average Australian single family house has doubled in size since about 1950. Exactly the same growth curve as in the United States. Uh, in fact, the average Australian house is now about 5% larger than the average uh, house in the United States, something that I wouldn't have thought was possible. Many of you, I'm sure, uh, like my wife and me, live in a house that's too large uh, and there are, and probably have the same experience we have, which is that there are are parts of our house that we uh, enter only to vacuum, uh, especially now that our children are grown. The environmental consequences of this are not only have to do with the, the materials that went into the construction of these spaces, but also the extraordinary amount of energy that goes into heating them and cooling them during the, during the summer, of furnishing them, of maintaining them, the paint, the, everything that we do to maintain our structures. Moving people and their daily destinations closer together also uh, greatly reduces their need for automobiles and makes efficient public transit possible. Uh, we often talk when we have environmental discussions about the need for more public transit. What's seldom acknowledged is that public transit alone doesn't do the job. You can't just apply public transit to an area that, that, can't, that is physically incapable of supporting it. Public transportation requires a significantly high level of pop population density to function at all. There, this has actually been studied. Uh, the, 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 the threshold level is about seven dwellings per acre, which is a uh, relatively high level of density in this country and in, and in my country. Uh, dense urban cores in the United States are among the very last places uh, where you see uh, uh, functioning uh, public transportation, also some of the very last places where you see people for whom walking is a primary mode of transportation. Uh, when uh, I recently I was using Google Earth and I looked at, at my house in Connecticut to see what the closest walking destination was to my back door and determined that it was my mailbox, which is 150 yards away uh, from my back door. And then I looked at the apartment building that my wife and I lived in when we were in New York City and used the same Google Earth ruler to measure 150 yards from the door of that apartment and found that there were uh, not one but two uh, full-size supermarkets, grocery stores. There was a wine store right in our building and a McDonald's around the corner. There was a shoe store and I wouldn't even know, a shoe repair store and I wouldn't even know where to find a shoe repair store where I live now, if they even still exist. Uh, there were a specialty food store that was the size of a supermarket. There was a Korean fruit and vegetable store. There were restaurants, half a dozen uh, bars and restaurants. And there were uh, residential buildings containing the residences of more people, uh, many more people in fact, than now live in, the, in my entire town. Uh, Metropol as a result, Metropolitan New York City is really the only place in the United States where public transit truly uh, works. Metropolitan New York accounts for almost a third of all the public transit passenger miles traveled in the United States, and it contains half of all the subway stops. Uh, someone told me, I don't remember the, which bus line it is, but there is a single bus route in New York City that accounts for more passenger uh, transit miles each year than the second largest urban bus system in the United States. This sort of density also allows uh, people to live without the environmental disaster of cars. The 54% of New York City households 
and 77% of Manhattan households don't, even, don't own even one automobile, and those that own them don't use them the way uh, I do, certainly. Uh, in the rest of the United States, this is also true in Australia, the number is pretty close to 0%. In uh, the United States in 2001, we crossed a sort of ominous threshold, which was that was the first year that the uh, number of registered vehicles in the United States for the first time exceeded the number of licensed drivers, which means we now have uh, more cars than people to drive them. Incidentally, Australia is the home of uh, two researchers who did the, really the fundamental uh, early research on this topic, on the topic of automobile dependence. Uh, Peter Newman and Jeffrey Kenworthy. They wrote a book that was first published in uh, 1990 and, and are kind of the global sources on, on this subject. Uh, density uh, also has an obvious downside, uh, which I'm sure anybody, all the, the, the reasons that people don't like cities. The significance, though, is that if we want these things that we talk about to work, if we want public transit to work, if we want to shrink our energy and carbon footprints, if we want to uh, reduce our uh, environmental impact. Population density, density of people and destinations is one of the few uh, tools that we really have, uh, effective tools that we really have at hand. I gave a talk, uh, or I attended a talk in New York City a couple of years ago and sat next to someone and he would asked me what I was up to and I explained uh, the basic idea that I've outlined to you here and he sort of frowned and he said, uh, he said, but that's just because New Yorkers are all crammed together. And I said, well, yeah, that's, the, that's really the point. And then he said, but all that energy efficiency, it's all unconscious. Uh, and that's sort of the point, too. When we build uh, energy efficiency into our, the way we live, when we make it a part of our infrastructure, we don't have to do anything. Uh, no one is more surprised than a Manhattanite to be told that he or she has the lowest per capita uh, energy use in the United States and the smallest carbon footprint. Uh, unconscious efficiencies are the very best ones because you don't have to police them. Uh, but the trick is uh, finding uh, the way to impo impose uh, this sort of thing. Nevertheless, the easiest most effective, lowest technology way to shrink uh, energy and carbon footprints is to shrink physical footprints, to make ourselves smaller on the earth is how we uh, make ourselves, is how we reduce our impact. The, and in, in terms of that, the, the car is the problem, and yet it's not the problem in the way that most of us think. The environmental damage that uh, cars, that we should be most upset with cars about, if we want to blame them instead of ourselves, is not the energy and emissions that they're responsible for directly, it's the way they allow and encourage us to live. It's the car that is the tool we've used to spread ourselves out and to drag behind us this, uh, this thing that, that we're now trying to wrestle with. When it, when it comes to solutions, uh, of course, solutions is what we all want, but when it comes to those solutions, we're, pretty, we're uh, uh, shockingly good at kidding ourselves, which I guess uh, nobody who has spent any time studying history of human civilization should, should be surprised by. I was talking with some people yesterday, and, and asked, he asked me what I was going to be speaking about, and I gave a 10-second explanation. He said, well, I just want, uh, I don't want to put up with any of this stuff, just I want, uh, you know, the green version of everything I've got. Which is, give me the car that isn't a problem, give me the house that isn't a problem, give me this that isn't a problem. And I, the, certainly, this is certainly true in the United States, and, and I assume that it's true in Australia as well, that most of us are happy to uh, sign on for solutions that involve buying things, happy to buy a new car, just tell me which one, you know, happy to remodel my kitchen with uh, bamboo on the floor and uh, recycled marble in the countertops. I'm happy to eat uh, better tasting eggs, uh, happy to divide, to divide my trash into two piles. Uh, in fact, recycling is one of the, the things where you perversely feel as though the larger your pile of recycling is, the more you're contributing to the solution. Similarly, with, uh, with automobiles, uh, a friend of mine recently bought a uh, hybrid Ford Fusion, and in the dashboard, there's a little uh, um, gauge that 
green leaves arise as you drive and, and it's impossible not to drive it without thinking that as you drive it you feel that you are actively doing something good for the environment. And there's a commercial, a television commercial for the Toyota Prius which shows something like the same thing. It shows a, a Prius driving through this grim uh, gray landscape but as the Prius passes everything bursts into bloom and turns green and smiling children pop up and you really do feel as though the, the sort of the, the car is driving through the landscape, vacu vacuuming up all the problems. Similarly, in the United States, I don't know if this is true in Australia as well, there's a large and, and growing number of people who have decided that the, the, the best thing that an individual can do to confront our considerable energy and uh, climate difficulties is to uh, raise chickens in their backyard. Uh, there, it's been a huge fad and my New Yorker colleague Susan Orlean has not only raised chickens but also written about it in, in the magazine and uh, Susan, I know from her writing, drives individual chickens to the veterinarian uh, in her SUV which gives the, the eggs they lay a carbon footprint that is off of any conceivable chart. <laughs> I, uh, and yet all these things are uh, extraordinarily difficult and I, I, I guess we don't really need anybody to, exp to say, keep saying how difficult they are but I want to give an illustration of how difficult they are. I was asked to give a talk in Chicago once and I'm told I needed to include a PowerPoint presentation and I, I'd never used PowerPoint before and wasn't really excited about it and I, I reluctantly uh, created PowerPoint presentation and then realized that I could reduce it to just two slides and so I, I, I had what I felt was the world's shortest PowerPoint presentation but since then I've discovered that I can reduce it to zero slides I don't even need the slides to give it all I need is my laser pointer which I have everyone should have a laser pointer this was my wife bought this uh, 20 years ago to put in my uh, son's Christmas stocking and I took it out um, but I'll, I'll show the first slide up here. This is a slide that was, uh, this is a photograph that was taken in Tampa, Florida about uh, 15 years ago during an effort by Tampa to build a light rail system not, a, not at all unlike the one in Melbourne, the terrific tram system in Melbourne. Melbourne incidentally is one of, the, <laughs> I don't think there's any place in the United States that didn't rip up its uh, tram system. Uh, as soon as it had the opportunity in the, early, in the early 20th century and Melbourne is to be congratulated. But in this uh, first slide here, uh, you'll see a typical uh, suburban street. It's four lanes across and it's covered from end to end, from this end to that end, as far as you can see with cars lined up bumper to bumper, door to door, four across as far as you can see in either direction. It's a typical suburban uh, rush hour traffic jam like the one that I was involved in yesterday coming through uh, St. Kilda, I think. The second slide, uh, which I'll show over here, shows the occupants of all those cars, all the cars that filled the screen in the first slide. It shows all those occupants sitting in chairs in the middle of the street. And where in this slide, the cars go from this end to that end, as far as you can see, in the second slide, the people sitting in those chairs, the occupants of all those cars, fit into a tiny, 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 teensy little space right in the middle, chairs four across. Uh, you could have room for them all in the back half of a single Melbourne tram car, and they'd all have seats. None of them would have to be standing. It's an argument for, the, for, for public transit. It's an argument for a tram system. And it's astonishing, even to me, I've done a lot of reading on this and thinking about this topic, it was astonishing to me to see how small the human element of our automobile problem is, how small it compacts down to. This tiny little seating of people, you know, just like not even the first two rows in, here in, in this auditorium. And yet, uh, the dark side, I would ask you to ignore the, uh, to think of yourself as one of the drivers in this, this slide over here with all the cars and take a look at this, another look at this uh, slide on, on the left, the one with the, 
the open roadway now and the driver sitting in the chairs in the middle and look at it through your eyes as a driver and what you see is what I see is thank God the traffic congestion is gone I could get back in my car and and drive and drive to work and this is the the crux of it and there was someone just mentioned in the introduction to talk about we we make our appliances more efficient and yet our energy consumption doesn't go down. In fact, it goes up. Uh, this has been the history of energy consumption, the history of human civilization. What we have, what we need, and what we haven't necessarily had is the courage to, not just to build the tram line that takes those drivers out of those cars, but also to take up, to eliminate, to remove the traffic lanes that draw them back out of the trams. And by them, I mean us. Uh, it's a, it's it's a very difficult thing. If you look at the, most of the solutions that we talk about when we talk about driving, most of them are, are presented as, as boons to the drivers. Okay? We'll eliminate congestion, your commute time will go down, driving will be a pleasure again. And driving is a tremendous pleasure. Um, I have a, a, another New Yorker colleague who uh, walked into the kitchen one day and found her 10-year-old son looking gloomy and uh, in the kitchen standing there and she said, what's wrong? What's the matter? He was 10 years old. He said, I wish I had a car. And uh, that's the, that's the, the conundrum. And uh, so I'll leave the, both those slides up there and you can think about them. The thought that I would like to uh, leave you with is that we talk a lot about sustainability. And the point I'd like to make is that sustainability is not a micro phenomenon. There's no such thing as a sustainable house or a sustainable office building or a sustainable household appliance. Uh, for the same reason that there could be no such thing as a one voter democracy or a one person economy. Uh, every house, office building and appliance uh, no matter where its power comes from or how many of its parts were made out of soybeans, every one of those is just a single element in the civilization-wide network of deeply interdependent relationships. And it's those relationships and not the elements that are the problem, the challenge, the thing that we're trying to deal with. Uh, sustainability, in other words, is a context. It's not a technology and it's not a gadget. And uh, that's that's what, we have to, that's what we have to wrestle with. To have some idea of how, just what a staggering problem this is, I recently, within the past month or so, I uh, published a profile of uh, an Australian in The New Yorker, uh, a, a young man named Saul Griffith, although I, he's in his 30s. I described someone in the magazine as young who was 38, and a fact checker who was 22 uh, deleted uh, young and said that factually I was incorrect that no one who was 38 years old could be considered young. <laughs> Griffith has estimated uh, that civilization, that all of us uh, collectively consume energy, the human race, consumes energy at an average, weight of, or average rate of approximately 16 trillion watts, 16 terawatts, uh, which is the equivalent of 160 billion 100 watt light bulbs burning all the time. Capping atmospheric greenhouse gases at 450 parts per million, which is the two degree centigrade target, uh, would necessitate holding global energy consumption at that rate forever and replacing all but three of those 16 terawatts over the next 25 years with energy uh, generated from a combination of the most promising renewable and non-carbon based sources, uh, photovoltaic, solar thermal, uh, wind, biofuels, geothermal, and nuclear uh, fission. And doing that, Griffith estimated, would require building between now and 2035, the next 25 years, the equivalent of all, all of the following. 100 square meters of new solar cells, 50 square meters of new solar thermal reflectors, and one Olympic swimming pool's volume of genetically engineered algae for biofuels uh, every second for the next 25 years. Uh, in addition, one 300-foot uh, diameter wind turbine every five minutes, 100 megawatt geothermal steam-powered turbine every eight hours, and one 3-gigawatt uh, nuclear power plant every week. Such a construction program is at least theoretically feasible, but if 
faces, as we all know, tremendous uh, problems. The design, approval, and construction of nuclear power plants in the United States is basically uh, uh, virtually stopped. It takes years, not seconds. Uh, and there are currently fewer than three dozen new plants being planned. And the further, uh, the further difficulty, the second slide problem there, is that if we think of 450 parts per million as our carbon target, then we have a carbon budget of approximately uh, 60 parts per million to spend as a human race between now and forever. And yet, building all these things, all these wind turbines, all the solar, all the photovoltaic panels, all this infrastructure will consume at least that amount. We will consume that entire budget just in doing that. Or as he pointed out, if building electric cars for the two billion new uh, inhabitants of the world that we expect over the next uh, few decades, uh, that too would con entirely consume before we even turn them on, before we charge them up, uh, before we plug them in to charge them up, simply the steel and the uh, foam, uh, soy foam uh, seat cushions, we would consume our entire remaining carbon budget. Uh, therefore, we have to find a, a different way. Technology isn't going to save us. New things aren't going to save us. Uh, I hesitate to even say flying New Yorker riders 10,000 miles uh, with their golf clubs to speak in Melbourne isn't going to save us. We need to look to our cities to see how we can arrange ourselves in, in uh, ways that at least give us a, a fighting chance of doing some of these things. And so that's where I'll leave it. Thank you very much.